All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, very, very excited to be here uh, with my dear friend, John. John and I know each other for almost 20 years. Sorry, John, giving out your age. Uh, no, so John is the president of Avalab, uh, the company behind Avalanche, which was one of the big blockchain uh, company. And so John asked me to um, interview him. So I thought, okay, I'll show up and ask some uh, fun questions. I'm happy to take questions from the audience. So if you have questions, raise your hand and we'll mix it up a little bit. So the first question for John, you know, I got involved in internet in 99. You know, I was a young kid out of college. And, and since then, I heard so many different jargons, right? Web 1, social, web 2.0, and now every, everybody is web 3.0. So for people like me who is very old, what is web 3.0? So Imran, first of all, I have to make sure everyone knows what Imran is about. Imran was first an investment banker. He actually took Alibaba and Google public. And after a, a very, very successful Wall Street career, he ended up at Snap. And he took Snap from zero revenues to 1.6 billion. And he took it from 50 employees, I think you were number 50, I guess, from 50 employees to thousands of employees. And Snap obviously is a community build. Um, and you know a lot more about community than most people do. But yet, at the same time, he wants to learn what community is all about in Web3. So your question, what is Web3? Web3, to me, is the internet of value. When you can tokenize something and change the digital right of ownership onto an asset and put it onto the decentralized blockchain, you're basically encoding the right of ownership and the rules of ownership, as well as the rules of how it can be transferred into a very transparent but yet secure system. And we, we can all think about Web3 easily if you're just tokenizing traditional financial assets. It'll take a lot of regulation uh, to, to get there. But the beautiful thing about Web3, in my opinion, is there will be unlocking of new assets and tokenizing new assets that probably no one in this room has ever even thought about. One example is there's a company called Brave. Brave has the Brave browser and the Brave search engine. They actually block your tracking of your search history and browsing history to, so you can preserve your privacy. And that is fantastic, obviously, because one of the biggest problems right now is people are upset that their privacy is being invaded. But it's even better. They allow you to opt in to monetize. So if you decide to opt in and monetize you will get paid in basic attention tokens directly from the advertiser. So think about how wonderful that will be if you decide to have the choice. You get the choice. That's true ownership. You can decide whether you want to maintain your privacy or you want to actually monetize it and get paid yourself instead of being a product to a third-party company like Snap, no disrespect, and be basically a page view or a CPM or a CPC a product for someone else, basically. That's what Web3 is going to be. So that's great. I love it. You know, and I'm a big proponent of privacy. And at, at Snap, we proposed uh, you know, privacy before anybody. Before privacy was a uh, you know, household conversation. But I guess the question is, you know, if you really want to build an ad business, you know, you need a lot of audience, right? If you look at some of the biggest ad companies, has billions of users, and uh, and then the second thing with ad is also that ad only works when you don't really, you know, if you opt in to see ad, that's not necessarily works that well. You know, I need to tell you about a product when you least expect, and I have to expect that you want it. So first of all, how do you really build a community, right, in a Web three dot world? Because you know, consumers are so, you know they're seeing so many things, you know, they're spending too much time on TikTok and Snap and other places. How do you grow, you know, your audience to like a billions of people? Well, I mean, that's, in, in Web3, it's a little bit different from Web2. Obviously, Web2, you know, Snap has, I think, 400 million users. Facebook still has over 3 billion users. Um, it starts small. That's the first thing. And the difference in Web3 as opposed to Web2 you have to think small first, and you really start building communities, and you ha think
think of it as concentric circles that get bigger and bigger. So you would take a small group of people that have the same belief system and you then get them into your community and then you slowly grow that one and you create more bigger circles because each one of those people have another friend and another friend and ultimately you get a bigger community. This will take time. I mean, it, Web3 is very, very young. It is the, it's similar to when, you know, 20 years ago you say we met. Well, 20 years ago, I don't know if people realize like Amazon had less than 20 million prime or uh, users actually. So this is that era. It's a very small, very emerging space, but it's got potential for explosive growth. And from a pragmatic perspective, if you want to build, start a small community, I'm going to start with his 10 people, and then we can grow faster and faster. Just start with his family over there. So how do you keep the stickiness, though, right? The, the, that, that, that's very, very hard, right? You know, people show up, you know, first new thing, all, lots of excitement, but then how do you keep them engaged day after day after, you know, for many years to come? Yeah, I mean, this is a great question because one of the problems with Web3 is that the switching costs are so low. And this is the promise of Web3. We want people to own their data, their digital fingerprint, and we want them to be able to take it from WhatsApp easily and move it to something else when they feel like that's a new community they want to be part of. So how do you retain your customers? Just like, though, in Web2 and all the companies you, know, you were involved with, the way they retain is because they lock them in with gates and innovation. We don't have the gates. So in Web3, you're gonna have to have constantly innovation, innovative features, products, tools. And you do have one competitive advantage over Web2, and is that Web3, we listen to the community a lot. The product cycle is more about build, ship, listen, then fix. Whereas in traditional product in you know, Web2, I have an, a teammate here who, who worked at Uber before, it is all about like measuring 10 times and then cutting once and knowing exactly what the user wants. Find a problem, solve it. Here, we get to listen to the community and the community understands that we're iterating and continuously innovation. So we don't have your gates, but we have a strong community that we can continue to iterate the product to keep the innovation going. So two questions that come up from it, right? So innovation is one, very expensive, and second, it's very hard to continuously repeat that, right? That is why you, know, you see some of the biggest company 20 years ago are no longer the biggest company today. And the companies that are biggest today in tech will no longer be biggest 20 years from now. And so the question is, how do you keep innovating? Because how do you fund the innovation? And how do you keep, you know, make sure that your innovation continue to perform better when there's so much competition everywhere? That's a great question. And this is exactly the reason why blockchain is in an open, permissionless, decentralized manner. The beauty of blockchains and permissionless blockchains is that the technology, or we call them Lego pieces, are actually composable. So you can take pieces from other people and then build on top of it and continue to innovate that way. You do not have to go to the VC and then spend the money on the full stack from the bottom all the way to the top. So you have a competitive advantage because you can start just at the top layer and you can take pieces from other people's work and build it. This is, the examples here will be, think about Linux. All right, so Linux took a long time to really populate. Other operating systems came out first because they were centralized and they were very, very good in the beginning. But ultimately, Linux has been around now forever and you know, firms that support it like Red Hat have now been bought by IBM and continue to have Linux grow. Another great example will be Wikipedia. I know everyone here probably goes to Wikipedia, but 20 years ago when we were young kids, there was another thing called Encarta. And Carta was the online encyclopedia from Microsoft. And I used it. I'm telling you, that was a lot better than the early Wikipedia, okay? But guess what? Microsoft shelled it in 2009 as Wikipedia took off because it's open source and continues to take off. So now what are we, like 12, 13 years later, and there's only Wikipedia? So the point is, when you can build on top of other people's innovation, you become more innovative. And then you can dream great things. 
Does it take longer, especially in the beginning? Yes, but I'm a believer that when you have a community that can collaborate, all of this will be actually better than the centralized version. So we're running out of time. Do I have time for two more questions? Sure, okay. So like one question that I've been thinking about for a while, right? So if you look at history, you know, anytime there is, you know, you organize this community and, you know, they all start with this very noble concept, you know, we're gonna change the world and we're gonna make it things better. And then somehow, somewhere, this one authoritative figure shows up and, and really exploit the community. And, and then either you need government or some sort of, you know, revolution to bring that, you know, social order. So how do we regulate these communities? You know, do we need to regulate these communities? And how do, if we not, how do you make sure that somebody somewhere is exploiting average person? That, that's an incredible question. I, I absolutely agree. But you know, there will be regulation, and we need to make sure retail does not get exploited because they're a big part of the community. Because in this community, in Web3, the user, the creator, and the owner, and the Governance is maybe all the same person as opposed to in a traditional tech company where there's a shareholder, there's a board of directors, there's a management company, and then there are individual users. So it definitely needs some regulation, but you're asking also things about human nature. Yeah, how, I think also, how can you have more regulation that's needed right now on a Facebook or some other of these Web2 social platforms that have now hijacked your digital fingerprint and sell it without your compliance? Yeah, and, and I think that it happened, right? So you, when somebody amass a lot of power, you always have the risk that individuals get marginalized. And that's why the democratic system, and you need you know, that some sort of check and balance so that nobody can amass a significant amount of influence. Um, the last question, we have to ask this question, right? Today, I think Bitcoin is, what, below 19,000? And uh, there are a lot of people, every time I turn on the TV, saying, you know, they're taking their victory lap, you know, the Bitcoin is down from 68,000 or something. Crypto prices are down. I'm sure a lot of people, you know, I still own some, and are feeling the pain. So what do you tell them? So I, t I tell them the following. Um, we've seen this, again, this is a function of traditional human nature. You know, and a lot of you who've listened to me talk before, you know that I believe in a few years, maybe five, 10 years, there's gonna be a world of hyper tokenization when anything of assets can be tokenized. But in the markets, there's always gonna be hyper excitement and hyper cynicism. And you're gonna to have to ride these ups and downs throughout. We've seen in the internet age, um, I think you know, your career was built by taking advantage of the valleys. No, it's true, because when an industry is young, you know, uh, it's like a kid, you know. And I, I, like I have a one, two kids, and when they're a little young, you know, one day you, they feel like they're going to be a rocket scientist. The other day you feel like they'll be something different. So, so when the, the, when an industry is young, you know, there's a lot of you know, uh, you know, you can predict a lot of things in the future, and that creates a lot of volatility. But I think with that, we're out of time. So thank you, John, and thank thanks you for having me here.